Today, I am going to review the movie, God's Country. Western Montana is a wild area consisting of both beauty and aridity, while God's Country concentrates more on the latter. The population are much the same, and the terrain is hard and frozen in its dismal portrayal of this vast, mountainous sweep. In Julian Higgins' profound and unsettling feature debut, which premieres this Friday, university lecturer Sandra sees a pine box disappear into a crematorium's waiting furnace early on. Her wrinkled face is etched with regret. She buries the bones in a snow-covered canyon not far from her home with a pickaxe. Sandra doesn't start talking until approximately eight minutes had passed. It takes her some time to realize that the recently died was actually her ill mother and God's country has already passed by half before she figures out how her mother and daughter ended up in these barren plains. Sandra gets home and sees a red pickup vehicle parked in her yard. She instructs the burglars to leave a letter behind the windshield as a warning. They return the following day instead. The handwritten note is found by Sandra near to a bloody bird carcass in the snow. When confronted, the two, Nathan and Sam, claim not to have seen Sandra's note but add that her farm provides the greatest launching points for hunting in the neighboring forest. The don't inquire. Sadly, neither is she. Sandra tows their truck the next morning and finds an arrow shot into her front door. The ominous clash of wills between Sandra and the hunters is now erupting into violence, creating the legendary spectacle of violence that has long been connected to the American West along with colonial ideas of frontier justice and manifest destiny. But it doesn't, at least not immediately. Higgins and cinematographer Andrew Wheeler maintain a state of charged stillness that gives their stark images, a cigarette smoking in the snow, a dilapidated house in the middle of nowhere, elemental weight and poetry, luring us to think of the power struggle at the film's center as something more existential than a conflict over territory. Long shots are used to highlight Sandra's insignificance in relation to and seclusion among the various buildings, houses, churches, and landscapes that dwarf her in one allusion to winter light, the short story by James Lee Burke from which God's Country was adapted. In another, a sacred piece of land affords Sandra and Nathan the chance to explore a connection that has been gently binding them together their entire lives. She asks herself and him, are you just what happened to you? Higgins first turned winter light as a short film. He and co-writer Shay Ogbana changed the protagonist from a white man in his 60s to a black woman in her 40s when they reworked it for a feature film. This choice greatly broadens the narrative's focus and intensifies its geopolitical undertone. Even if God's country is no longer solely about one man's moral struggle to resist the violence ingrained in him, it nonetheless examines cycles of masculine aggression. This is particularly evident in a dramatic scene where the quarrel is mediated by the acting sheriff. The terrible results of this attempt to defuse the situation also reflect the contempt many locals, both white and indigenous, reserve for law enforcement and highlight yet another failing institution Sandra cannot rely on. But God's country is equally adept at conveying the cumulative weight of Sandra's experiences as a black woman driven to succeed in this underdeveloped, rural area of the country, and as a result unwilling to give even the slightest amount of ground in her interactions with the natives. When she first meets Nathan, he finally acknowledges his reluctant admiration for her tenacity. However, we later discover that his affection is tainted by his past. Samuel is even more terrifying, as he is portrayed by White with a gaunt, wolf-like hunger that might be more than just a bluff. Why are you acting this way? After following him home, Sandra asks. She retreats swiftly in an effort to gain the upper hand due to the menacing look in his eyes. The movie also shows the toll that Sandra's constant exposure to racial hostility and gender-based violence has taken on her, including at her university, where the department head only cares about inclusivity to a certain extent. A revelation involving a student she's taken care of causes Sandra to reach her breaking point. Newton, an actress of great grit and grace who can convey more emotion in a single, simmering look than many pages of language could exposit, is at every turn amplifying the emotional impact of this story. She appears in every scene of God's country, and she rises to the challenge with the best performance of her career, a combination of fierce strength and tenderness. Newton makes clear Sandra's internal conflict between real defiance and learnt sadness as the fight of her life, even yet the film's attitude of serious restraint also characterizes her art. Because of this, the growing exhaustion of her character, the transformation of her hate, tenacity, and convictions into a frigid, annihilating fervor that drives the film to its climax, has the sense of approaching disaster associated with a storm, a reckoning, and a tragedy. There are times, Sandra tells her kids, when it feels like nothing ever changes. But I can assure you they do. They have to. 
we're left to wonder what sacrifices will be necessary to end the cycles of violence and institutional oppression that have shaped so much of America's history, society, and self-knowledge as God's country approaches its darkly exciting last shot. It's a question posed in a different way in the movie's opening scene, which takes place in a dimly lit classroom and shows images of American conquest for no one but us to see more clearly. These images include a rack of bison pelts, two white men towering over a Native American tribesman, and a black woman with a bruised eye. 